What's going on guys? My name is Mark Wagner and today I'm going to be bringing you a video that I think you're going to get a ton of value out of and that is how to start going from 0 to 5k on a brand new dropshipping store as a complete beginner. Now I launched this store about a month ago and I brought it from 0 to 5k in about 10 days which um, is pretty good and um, I'm going to be showing you literally like every single step that I took in order to do that. So I'm sure that you're going to get a ton of value out of this and let's go ahead and hop right into it. All right, so like I said earlier, this video is basically going to be based around a store that I launched last month and I brought from zero to 5k in about uh, 10 days. And for the record, that was profitable too. Like within those first 10 days, I was profitable. Um, so I'll go ahead and tell you what this store was. This store was a trending product. It was a seasonal product and I was selling purge masks. So a lot of you have probably seen those purge masks. They're like probably one of the most saturated drop shipping products ever, but um, they work and they worked for me because I was selling them at the right time. And I also kind of know what I'm doing uh, which definitely helped me out. But anyway, I'm going to be like straight up telling you like every single step that I took and I'm going to be showing you too in my ads managers just so you guys can see like, um, you know, what it really looks like. And I'm not going to, I'm not just like saying words to you, you know, like I'm also showing you, I'm just going to go ahead and refresh my dashboard here just so you guys can see that, you know, I'm not one of those fake gurus out there and um, you know, all this is legit and I'm literally just, I'm telling you what I did for free. So um, I hope this is going to be of immense value and I think that it will be. So if it is, just do me a favor and hit that like below and let's go ahead and hop right into the value. All right, so step one is finding a trending product. Like I said, uh, this is based on a trending product. I sold a seasonal product, which is a really good idea coming up because we have Christmas, uh, we have Valentine's Day. There's some very, very big products for Valentine's Day that I'm certainly going to be selling and I will recommend you do the same. But um, anyway, it doesn't necessarily have to be a seasonal product. There's plenty of trending products out there at any given point in time. Like there's at least one like really, really big trending winner. Uh, whether you know about it or not, there's usually a lot more than one. But anyway, I'm not going to be going like super in depth in this video how to find trending products just because I have like five videos on that already. And um, I'm going to throw those in the description below if you do need to learn how to find a trending product. However, uh, I am going to be talking about how you validate a trending product to like kind of decide if it's worth selling or not. So um, <clears throat> the way I do this is by going to adspy.com. Now adspy is a paid service. It's like 150 or $200 a month. Uh, which is crazy so i just use the free trial and you guys can do the same thing they give you like a thousand free views and it's awesome it's a really great service um so yeah basically the thing that you want to do here is look for how much competition you have so um you know mainly look at ads that have over a thousand views so you can sort by um sorry over a thousand likes so you can sort by the amount of likes that ads have and then um you're really looking for just like three to six, you know, it can be a little more, a little less. Uh, but ideally, you don't really want to see any products that have over 10 ads uh, that have over a 1000 likes on them, because that probably means that the product is saturated. And then another thing that you can look for here is like how long the product has been around, how long people have been running it. And then like for the purge mask, for example, there was more than 10 ads with over a 1000 likes, but they were all from last year. So I knew that the product I was gonna like you know get hot again um so you know i took advantage of that and if it's a seasonal product then it's probably going to be the same thing um and then another thing that you should look for while you're on ad spy is like look at what types of ads are doing really well like for example if like you know a video ad showing like the product like a walk around or something like that is doing very well or if it's like you know a really long video talking about the features of the product or you know just stuff like that um, really just get a good idea of what's working for other people so that you can try to reverse engineer that. And I say reverse engineer and not copy uh, because you really shouldn't be copying someone else. Uh, you should just kind of be like, you know, taking their ideas and borrowing a couple things from them, but not like the exact, um, you know, the exact ad. You actually want to improve upon that ad. Uh, so 
one of the great things about um, AdSpy is that you can actually download ads straight from the platform, uh, which is great. But again, I wouldn't recommend you copy the ad. I would recommend you maybe borrow a clip or, uh, you know, take their thumbnail if it's really good. Or, um, you know, just you should, um, you know, try to mimic the strategies that your top competitors use. Uh, because obviously what's working for them is probably going to work for you too. And then, like I said earlier, competition is actually a really good thing if it's a healthy amount. Uh, but you don't want to have like a ton of competition on a product because then it's probably going to be really hard to make money with. All right, so step two is making a one product store or a general store. Now, I would recommend making a general store unless you're like 100% positive or like 95% sure uh, that the product is a winner and it's going to work for you. Like for the purge masks, like those were like, you know, six or maybe even a seven figure product last year, uh, probably definitely a seven figure product. So I knew that like they were going to come back around as all like um, seasonal products do to a certain extent. Uh, so because of that, I just like went ahead and made a one product store. And then, um, you know, a one product store should really be like a stepping stone to a niche store. Like with the purge max, I'll be honest with you, like I kept it in one product store, but I really should have like expanded upon that and sold like other masks and possibly other like Halloween items. But I didn't uh, just because I knew that literally that store was like only going to last for a month and a half or like two months or so. Uh, so, you know, I wasn't going to really waste my time and build out an entire store for it. But, um, you know, for any other circumstance, I would definitely recommend uh, having a niche store that's centered around one product instead of just having a one product store. Now, when it goes to actually designing your site, less is definitely more. Um, literally, like if it's a one product store, especially like people are just going to be on your product page and you really don't need to do anything crazy uh, to get them to buy from you. It's actually the opposite. Like you want to you wouldn't have a really, really basic site that has clear call to actions and it's straight to the point. So what I mean by that is that you don't want to have a bunch of distractions on your website. You don't want to have three different pop-ups and like all of these, you know, crazy things going on. Uh, so what I do is I just use a default Shopify theme, which is called debut. And then I kind of make my site look branded, which means like, you know, I have a really good logo. Like I hire someone on Fiverr to make that for me. And then I use the same colors of the logo on my website. So I have the same color, like add to cart button. And I have the same color header. And I have the same color, like everything everywhere, um, you know, just so it appears as a more branded website. And then the only apps that I use to start off with is sticky cart, which basically means if a customer scrolls past the add to cart button, uh, then there's going to be like an add to cart that like stays on their screen. Uh, just so there's always a clear call to action, like I said. And then I also use Privy or Wheelio. And th those are basically just email pop-ups. So that uh, if a customer is trying to leave your website, it'll come up and it'll be like, uh, don't leave yet, you know, take 15% off if you put in your email. And uh, there's two good things about that. One is that you get emails. So if you want to do email marketing, that really helps. Um, and then you also get a lot of people that wouldn't have previously purchased buying your stuff uh, just because they have a discount. So another um, app that I use is called Nice. And this basically just pops up with your recent orders. Uh, that really helps people trust you a lot more because they see, oh, if Shelly from Florida bought it, then I can too. You know, it, it also like adds a bit of scarcity, you know, because if you say like, you know, we only have 10 more in stock, and three people bought it on the time that they've been on your website, then they know that they should probably hurry up and buy your stuff. And then um, another app that I use is called Looks. This is a review app. Uh, reviews are really, really big for trust and you know social proof and stuff like that. Uh, so I definitely recommend that you use Looks or another photo reviews app. Looks is the only paid app that I'm using uh, when I launch a store. And I believe it's $5 a month, maybe it's 10. Uh, but anyway, it's not really that expensive. And like I said, there are a couple other photo review apps out there, uh, just not as good as looks. And then the last app that I use is called Oberlo. Um, that's a really basic app and it basically just allows you to sell straight from AliExpress. Okay, so the next thing uh, that you gotta do to your store is adding certain pages. So you need to add a privacy policy, 
a contact us page, a returns and refunds page, a frequently asked questions page. And if you are aiming for a more branded store, then I'll recommend adding an about us page. Um, so those are pretty self-explanatory. And um, I believe I do have a video where I explain those. So I'll just link that below. And um, that video, I basically just built a store from scratch. So if you want to see like the strategies that I use and all the stuff that goes into it, and you can just check out that video below. And then uh, just to touch up on theme customization, uh, some things that you should make sure that you do is enable the quantity selector, which means people can you know, choose to buy four items instead of one, which is the default. Uh, so that's really big. You know, I had someone that bought like eight masks for me, uh, which was cool because you don't really get that often. Uh, so yeah, that was awesome. And then um, you should also add a favicon, which is basically just a little logo in the browser tab. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. And then a sale header bar. That's basically just like, um, like a, it's a little header at the top when people are on your page. It's just like, uh, you know, 60% off sale and soon. Um, and then another thing that I will recommend you do is disable dynamic checkout buttons. Uh, so a dynamic checkout button is where people go on your website and it'll be like, uh, check out with PayPal, check out with Amazon pay, check out with Apple pay. And those are all going to be below the add to cart button. Personally, I don't use those. I found conversions are higher. If you just have one button and that button is a buy now button for one product stores. Um, and then for non one product stores, you want to do an add to cart button. The way that you get a buy now button is you download another app. Um, that's called like straight to checkout. There's a bunch of different, um, apps for that, but, uh, basically it just skips the cart page and, that's not something that I do like automatically when I launch a store, but it's definitely something that I test. And it's definitely something that usually has a good impact on my conversion rates. And then um, another thing that you want to do is remove the power by Shopify, which is basically just a little message on the bottom of your website that says powered by Shopify. And then another thing that you should do for the bottom of your website, which is called your footer is uh, customize it because by default, it's going to have like a weird, like about us that, Obviously it doesn't make sense because Shopify doesn't know anything about you. So make sure you remove that or at least like customize it. So it makes sense. And then uh, the last thing that you want to do is make sure you add your logo to your checkout, uh, just because people are obviously going to trust you more and um, it adds to the branding and helps improve your conversion rate. All right. So step three is making ads and social media. So making ads is like ads are your bread and butter, you know? Uh, your store and like everything else that goes into it is such a small amount of like what goes into your success with e-commerce. So your ads need to be really, really good. And I would recommend you do video ads. Uh, you can always test picture ads, but video ads always, always, always work best for me. It doesn't matter what the product is. And I only use pictures for retargeting. Uh, so yeah, definitely make a bunch of ads and I would recommend making at least three ads. And then two different ad copies and an ad copy is basically just like the description uh, for your ads. So like, for example, if an ad pops up on your newsfeed, you're obviously going to see like a video or a picture. And then like below that, it's going to say like, you know, we're giving out this product 60% off for 24 hours. Click shop now. You know, that's just an example. Obviously uh, don't use that ad copy, but um, yeah, I would recommend having at least two of those. And then that's really like a lower budget. Like, you know, it's a, uh, kind of like a, a slacker way to do it. So I will recommend ideally having five video ads, three ad copies, three different thumbnails and five scroll stoppers. But the scroll stoppers you only want to test once you found a winning ad, which we're going to talk about how to do in step four. But um, a couple more things about making ads in social media is that like I was saying earlier, you want to reverse engineer your competitors best ads. Um, so a scroll stopper is basically like the first three to five seconds of a video and a lot of e-commerce entrepreneurs use these to kind of capture uh, people's attention because when people are scrolling on their newsfeed, they're not going to stop for an ad unless it really catches their attention. So scroll stoppers are really, really big. And then thumbnails are really big too. Uh, one of the, one of the ways that I did so well with purge mass is my thumbnail, honestly, like straight up it had a girl in skimpy clothing uh wearing my purge mask and that made a lot of guys were my target market so that made a lot of guys 
like stop and click on the ad and actually watch the video. And because of that, I'm sure that I got a lot more sales. And then um, another thing is that you want to do square ads if possible. And then if you're just running with Instagram, then you can also do a four by five ad. And that basically just means the ratio. So like, um, you know, horizontal by vertical would be four by five. And then the last thing is that Twitter style ads work really good for younger audiences. So that's exclusively what I was doing for the Purge store. And uh, like I said, those did really well because I did have a younger demographic that I was targeting. A Twitter style ad is basically just where you have like a video or a picture and then there's like white space around it and like a little caption at the top. So it looks like it was a post from Twitter and it's like the same kind of style, uh, but it's really not. And then I just make those on an app called InShot. And then I do have a tutorial that basically shows me making a video like step by step. And I'll leave that in the description below. And then the last thing that you need to do is make your Instagram and Facebook pages. Um, and then obviously make like a business page so that you can connect these two and that it shows up when you're running your advertisements. And then personally, I would recommend you post one time a day on Instagram and then you can actually connect your Instagram to your Facebook so that it posts on both pages at once. And that's what I do. Uh, that's what I did and that helps with a lot of things. All right, so step four is your creative testing. Now a creative is basically just an ad. It's like a video or a picture or whatever you're using to advertise your product. And uh, the reason that we do this first or like fourth, I guess, but the reason why we do this before running any ads is that it wouldn't really make sense to like, um, to be testing different ads as we're testing different audiences. It's a lot more effective if you test your ads first and that way you can use your best ad uh, to kind of figure out what audiences work best. So um, I would just recommend you make your first campaign on your Facebook ads and then have one ad per ad set. Just don't touch any of the targeting except the countries. Um, so the countries you should do United States, United Kingdom, Canada and Australia. And that's basically called the big four uh, because it's the four biggest countries in the world that mainly speak English. And then um, if you do have like a niche product, which probably wouldn't be a trending product, but it's definitely possible. Uh, but if you do have a niche product, then you should do some interest. And I would recommend that you just do like the broadest interest that you can think of for that niche. Like for example, if it was like the cooking niche, then just write cooking, you know, like just make it as broad as possible, um, like over 20 million people. And then um, one thing that you should do for this creative test is optimize for view content. Now that sounds pretty scary, but literally it's just like one thing that you need to do on your ad set um, that where instead of optimizing for purchases, you optimize for view content, which basically just means you're going to get a lot of people that view your product but probably not any that actually buy it. And that's not the uh, purpose of this campaign. The purpose is just to see which ad works best. Uh, so once you've gotten all of those ad sets set up, then you wanna set a rule uh, so that they run until they hit 2000 impressions. Now an impression is basically just when someone sees your ad. And then um, the way you set a rule, I'll actually show you in a second. Uh, but it's really, really easy. And then after 2000 impressions, you can compare the click through rate and the cost per link click to find your winning ad. It should be really obvious, honestly, uh, but you know, you can basically just see that, okay, 5% of people uh, click through like to my website when they saw ad one. And then 1% 1 of people click through to my website when they saw ad two. So obviously ad one is going to be the winner. And then cost per link click is also pretty self-explanatory. That's just like, you know, how much it costed you uh, to get someone to go ahead and click to your website. And then once you have hit 2000 impressions, you should also hit the breakdown tab uh, to kind of see if there was like a specific group of people uh, that were like adding the product to their car or maybe purchasing, or uh, maybe they were just like viewing like a lot more than any other like groups of people. So the one, like the three things that you need to look for with breakdowns is age, gender, and placement. So placement is basically just where your ad is shown. And then age and gender are pretty self-explanatory. 
All right, so we're gonna be hopping into my ads manager and going over this campaign just so you guys can see how it looks. So this is September 8th through 18th, like I said, uh, and I was showing you back then, this is when I launched on Facebook. So as you can see, I was averaging a 1.93 return on ad spend. The break even was about 1.52 for this product. And um, as you can also see, I literally didn't get a single sale from my uh, creative campaign, but that's okay because like I said, the only point of this is to test your ads. Uh, so as you can see, I'm kind of a try hard. So I tested a bunch. Uh, not all of these are from like when I first launched. Um, but yeah, so all you really got to do is sort by click through rate. Um, it's super easy, but as you can see, these ads were like my obvious winner. So, uh, this is thumbnail two and thumbnail three. These are both for ad eight and ad eight was my clear winner followed by ad three and ad seven and ad three. And you know, as you can see, um, a, basically a 21% click through rate compared to some with like a four click through rate, you know, that's obviously going to be your winning ad. And then as far as cost per link click goes, um, I guess it's cost per view content. Um, that's kind of odd how, uh, my second and third and fourth were less than my first. But anyway, as you can see, you're still comparing seven cents to about 30 cents. So obviously ad eight was my clear winner. And then I'm just going to go in on the ad set level and, you know, just show you how this campaign looks when you set it up. All right. So as you can see, basically the first thing is just optimizing for view content. Like I was saying earlier. Uh, this is probably going to say purchases and all you got to do is click the X and then hit view content. And then, um, as you can see, I was targeting literally everyone in Australia, Canada, UK, and the United States, uh, just automatic placements and that's it. So really the only difference that you're going to have between your ad sets is just the ad so that you're able to compare them and it's an even comparison. All right. So step five is your interest test. Now this is what you should do after you find your winning ad, uh, make a new campaign and then have 10 different ad sets where each have one single interest in them. And then I normally try to stick to between 1 million and 20 million for my audience size. And then, uh, when I'm launching a new product, I really try to get a broad, like a broad range of who I think may be interested in the product. So as you're going to see, as I hop into my ads manager in a second, like for the purge, I was targeting like, you know, video games. I thought they may be interested in the product. And I was targeting like, um, I don't even remember off the top of my head, like sports, like, uh, you know, just a whole big range of people that I think may be interested in the product. And I try to really have like, a variation, like a really large variation in my interest, just so that I'm able to hit like every, uh, every part of the market basically so that I can see what works because, um, once you do start to find some ads that work, like for example, if you have one interest that was targeting video games and that did really well, well, Hey, there's a bunch of different ways that you could go from that. You could target call of duty, you could target halo, you could target Xbox, you could target PlayStation, you know, just all these different things. Uh, but you know, I, again, I try to start off and like leave it very, very broad just so that I'm able to, you know, uh, get more detailed once I figure out what works. So, um, really the only things that I change here is I add New Zealand, um, you know, just, just cause, <laughs> and then, um, I only touch my ages and gender and placement. If during the breakdown, there was an obvious winner. So I'm actually just going to show you really quickly how to break something down uh, because this is a beginner friendly video. All right. So we're just going to go ahead and break down by gender. And as you can see here, uh, male actually had a lower click through rate than, oh, sorry, that's on category. So yeah, male had a much higher click through rate and uh, males were end up who I basically was targeting like uh, the entirety that I ran this product. So again, you can just break down by hitting this tab and then clicking by delivery and then choosing what you want to break down by. So, um, like I said, you should only touch those if there's a super, super, super clear winner. Um, but it's really not a big deal. If there's not, there's probably not going to be, and that's fine. Cause we can break it down after we run these interests. 
So before I show you my interest campaign, I just want to say like talk about what you do after you launch these interests. So um, if you have a lower ticket product, which means in my opinion, below $40, uh, then kill ads that have, sorry, kill ad sets that have spent over $20 and not gotten any purchases. And then you should constantly keep cycling in more interest based on what's working. Like I was saying earlier, like if the video game interest is working well, then you can do Call of Duty and Xbox and stuff like that. And then um, as you start to get more data, keep breaking it down to kind of find your target market. And then eventually you're going to find like a constant audience that works really, really well. Like for this product, it was 18 through 30. It was big five, which is just US, UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, and then Instagram and Facebook feeds worked really well. And like I said earlier, men. All right, so just to show you this interest campaign, as you can see, uh, now I have 290 ad sets in here. But when I was first starting out, I launched 10. And then I just kept launching more and kept launching more. And that basically just took me to 5k alone. This is probably like 20 ads uh, within that one week, something like that. But anyway, uh, just to show you how it looks on the ad set level, um, I was breaking it down a little bit here because I kind of figured what my target market was as I started to get more like sales, um, you know, from these interest tests, I was breaking it down. And then uh, from there, I was just like, okay, well, you know, if 18 through 24 is doing really well, then I'm just gonna go ahead and cut out all the other age ranges uh, for the interest that I'm currently running right now. So as you can see, I do $8 a day budgets. Um, I just do that across the board, all my stores, all my ad set level budgets, they all start at $8. And then um, I actually wasn't targeting New Zealand in this one, uh, but I normally do just because it's a big five. And then um, 18 through 24, like I said, men, I also broke that down. And then just one single interest. And then from there, uh, at this point, I was doing automatic placements. And then I gradually changed that to Instagram and Facebook feeds only. And that's basically it. Um, you know, everything was exactly the same. And then for the ad, the only thing that I was doing is I was using an existing post, which basically just means uh, the engagement is going to stack upon itself. So like, if you were running two different ads, like two different ad sets uh, that both have the same ad, but you weren't using an existing post, then you're going to have two separate ads when one may have like 100 likes and one may have 300 likes. But if you do use an existing post, then, you know, you're going to have 400 likes instead of one with 300 and one with 100. And that really stacks up. I end up getting an ad with like 1.1 thousand reactions, uh, which was pretty cool. And then I got another with like, 900 uh, so anyway that's really good for social proof and you basically just um, create an existing post by going to your page post and then just uh, creating it it's pretty pretty self-explanatory from there all right so like I said interest tests alone basically took me from zero to 5k but um you know I'm not gonna stop there uh, who wants to stop at 5k at that point you just want more so I'm gonna be telling you uh, what you need to push past that. So uh, the next step is look like audience test. Now this is not just like one step. This is kind of a gradual thing uh, that you're going to start to do next. And then you're going to keep doing um, for the end of time. <laughs> um, so the first look like audience that you need to test uh, is 95% video view. Now you can make this audience once you receive 2,095% views. Um, and then you can basically just like throw all of those audiences into your existing interest campaign. Uh, now some people say that like you should, you know, segment your campaigns, like you should have one campaign for interest and one for 95% video view and one for another lookalike audience. Uh, but personally, whenever I'm just testing audiences, I just throw them all into one campaign and do ad set level budgets. And then if I ever want to take something and scale it, then I put it in a CBO. We'll talk about CBOs in a second, but anyway, it's back to look like audiences. So after 95% video view, then you're probably going to want to test your view content look like audience, which you can do after 2000 uh, website visitors. And basically uh, you don't want to have any of those website visitors from your creative uh, campaign. So, on your creative campaign, you're optimizing for view content, 
So you're going to get a ton of visitors, but very few of those are actually going to be interested in your product. So instead, uh, you just want to look at your Facebook and say, uh, you know, I've gotten 2000 just for my interest test. So that means we should go ahead and launch that lookalike audience. And after that, you're probably going to be able to do your 75% video view uh, lookalike audience, which you should do after about 4,000, like 3,500, somewhere around there. But anyway, that's probably going to be the next lookalike audience that you want to test. And then just continue doing that once you get about 1,000 events uh, for basically like every other lookalike audience. And an event is basically just like someone doing something to like trigger a lookalike audience. Like for example, um, you know, if you had a thousand people that go on your website, then that's a thousand events. Uh, so you can continue doing this for add to cart, initiate checkout, website conversion, which basically means purchases. Um, and then there's some more advanced ones that you can do, like 5% time spent, which is uh, the 5% of the people that spend the most time on your website. And then you can do that for 10% as well. Um, and then you could also test Instagram and Facebook engagement, which is just people that like, they like your posts on Instagram or Facebook. And then when you're creating these lookalike audiences, you should make five individual audiences for one through 5%. Like for example, you should have a one, a two, a three, or four, and a 5% audience. And then you should have one audience that like, it goes from five to 10%. Now this is probably gonna be a lot easier when you actually go to create the audience. Um, if you don't know what I mean, but it's really simple. Anyway, you should have six audiences. And then um, if these ad, if these audiences don't end up doing well, you can always remake them. Like for this purge store, I remember my view contents did not do well originally. So I just kept like pushing, you know, I did other lookalike audiences and other interests and stuff like that. And eventually I had just like a ton view contents. Like I had like over 10,000, you know, and uh, the lookalike audience that I made before was based on like 2000. So that's obviously a lot more effective uh, when you have more data. So I went ahead and I remade my view content lookalike audiences and they did really, really well. There's some that are still running to this day. So you're definitely going to be at over 5,000 at this point. Um, it's really, really not that hard. <laughs> um, like I said, I did it just from interest. If you do have a good product and like everything else is set up the right way, then you're definitely on your way to a six figure product. Some other steps that are going to get you to a six figure product is just um, getting your conversion rate to be the highest that it can be. Now, there's a lot of things that you can test for this. Um, one of those is different apps. Like I was saying, I use an app that like skips the cart and goes directly to checkout. That made like a 0.5% difference in my conversion rate, which may not sound like a lot, but it really, really is when you're pushing like big numbers. And then obviously just messing with your description, you know, changing up your photos, uh, maybe increasing or decreasing your price. And there's a bunch of other things that you can do to optimize your conversion rate. Another thing is adding upsells. Um, upsells are really, really, really big. I've made like on the purge store alone, I made like over $2,000 from sweet upsell. And that's just an app that like after a customer checks out, it'll be like, Hey, thanks for your purchase. You've unlocked a special discount for, you know, 40% off of another purge mask. And they're like, Oh, heck yeah, I can give this to my friend. And you know, we can be Fringles on Halloween. I don't know, but, um, tons of people buy it. And like I said, like it's over $2,000 at this point. Um, and then, you know, you can also upsell people on different products. And that's really the advantage of having a niche store compared to a one product store. And then set up email sequences. Um, I have a video that talks about this really, really in depth. And I use an app called Campaign Monitor to do this. And then just keep testing new creatives. Like I was saying earlier, you should always keep testing new interests, but keep testing new creatives, new ad copies, new thumbnails, new scroll stoppers. Like I was showing you earlier, like I tested like 20, uh, 20 different creatives. And that's how I found the one that, you know, was able to be scaled to like over a thousand, you know, reactions, which was definitely over a million video views. Another thing you may want to consider do is using Instagram influencers. Now I did not do this as hard as I could have, uh, but I probably ran like seven or eight different influencers for the purge store. And that generated me a little over a thousand in revenue. 
Uh, but it definitely wasn't as profitable as Facebook was for me personally. However, some products just hit with Instagram influencers. Uh, so I definitely recommend you look into that, especially if you have like a younger demographic for your product. And then CBO scaling, I have a video that goes completely into this, uh, but just like a couple like um, examples of CBO scaling will be top five, and that's just your five best ad sets, and then top 10, and then demo scaling, which is basically where you like have absolutely no targeting except your age and or your gender. So like, for example, uh, you have a CBO campaign and one ad set is targeting 18 through 24 males. And then one ad set is targeting 18 through 24 females. And then one ad set is targeting 25 through 30 females. And then one ad set is targeting 25 through 30 males. Um, that may not make sense to you, but it's really not that hard of a concept. And then super look like audiences. Um, those are pretty hard to explain. Honestly, that's not a beginner friendly video. Uh, so if you want me to make like a full video, like in depth on CBOs, I'm happy to do so. Just drop a comment below. And then one of the best, most effective CBOs for me was taking my 15, like the top 15 of my ad sets that had died out and then putting all of those in a CBO at $50 that, that had like a three point, like, I don't know. I could go look, maybe I'll show you after this. But it was like almost a four return on ad spend really, really consistently. Um, so yeah, CBO scaling is really where you make the bulk of your money. Um, and then the next thing that you want to do for like scaling like to the big, big guy numbers is uh, getting an agent. Now, a fulfillment agent is basically just a guy from China who hooks you up with cheaper prices and faster shipping. Um, I really like my agent right now. So if you would like me to connect you with him, uh, just go ahead and shoot me a DM on Instagram. And you're also welcome to do that if you have any questions. Uh, you know, just let me know, shoot me a DM or comment below. Alright guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video. I put a lot of effort into this and I hope that you're able to get a ton of value out of it. And if so, then do me a favor and hit that like button below so that other people are able to see this video and get the same amount of value out of it. If you have any questions about the strategies or dropshipping in general or anything at all, then feel free to DM me on Instagram. It's going to be above my head and in the description below. Again, thank you so much for watching. I really hope that you're able to get a ton of value out of this video. You guys have an awesome day and I'll see you in the next one.